capitalism has exploited people and often leaves out people of color, immigrants, minority communities, women. At some point, people are like, no, you cannot do that to me and to my community in my home. And therefore, the only way to keep it going is to use force. Hi, today on The Laura Flanders Show, change within the system or changing the system? Activist entrepreneur Judy Wicks talks about her work to make business more human, while movement theorist Gopal Dianini explores how capitalism itself works. Plus a comment from me on how Starbucks came to Hungary. Was it new? Yes, but not new enough. It's all coming up. Welcome to the program. Activist entrepreneur. It's not often you hear those two words connected, but they are deeply in the life of our next guest. Judy Wicks, among other things, founded White Dog Cafe in Philadelphia. Long before that, she was responsible for Free People Clothing, which became Urban Outfitters. She's also one of the co-founders of Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And she's out with a new book just published last year, by Chelsea Green, Good Morning Beautiful Business, The Unexpected Journey of an Activist Entrepreneur and Local Economy Pioneer. Judy Wicks, very glad to have you with us in the studio. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Lara. Good to be here. Activist Entrepreneur in a nutshell? I use good food to lure innocent customers into social activism. You're talking about White Dog Cafe. You've told the story many times, but not to our audience. Will you uh, take us back there? Well, I, st I started the White Dog Cafe on the first floor of my house in 1983. And we were known for a number of different things. Uh, one of them was that we became a, a hub for a progressive dialogue uh, and had different programs such as table talks or storytellings or community tours, international tours to see how U.S. foreign policy affected the lives of others. But probably we were best known for buying from local farmers yeah. and helping to accelerate the local food movement uh, in the Philadelphia region. And this grew in a way out of your effort to save a neighborhood. Yes, yes. Um, when I first moved onto the block, which was in 1972, I fell in love with this beautiful block of Victorian brownstone houses. And then after I moved into my apartment there, I found out that the block was slated for demolition to make way for, of all things, a mall. <laughs> and I thought, how could it be that these beautiful brownstones would be demolished to make way for fast food restaurants and chain stores? So I think that's really uh, where this began for me. Uh, uh, and uh, over time developed into uh, the, being a leader in the localization movement to protect our community uh, from uh, global multinational corporations. Now, living economies, what does that phrase mean to you and do you have examples? Well, a living economy is one that supports life, both community life and uh, envir our environment, natural life, as well as long-term uh, financial life. And we, so our business alliance for local living economy is also local. So it's about um, doing this in place. And so examples in terms of concretely what people can see, because it's sometimes a vague concept, local. Um, my food maybe comes from within 500 miles, but does that make, does that make my food economy a local living economy? Well, uh, the living part um, uh, is really about working in harmony with nature in terms of uh, the environmental part of that idea. Um, so it's not just our food coming local, but our food being uh, organically grown and um, uh, meats coming from farms where the animals are raised on pasture and not in the horrible industrial factory farms. Uh, and so also local is about local culture and local identity and having retail stores that um, give a, um, a character uh, to a town or city and not look the same everywhere you go because they're all uh, chain stores. Um, so, um, and, and I think, you know, also uh, it's about how local ownership really um, creates the foundation for community life, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, uh, and how uh, this uh, local businesses really are the foundation for uh, building strong communities. So when you talk to other business leaders, and I know that you do that as well, how do you get them past the barrier that goes up so quickly for many? Well, that's going to be more expensive to do it that way. I won't make as much money. To have a lo local, actually to have a local market, um, it's less money for advertising <laughs> because it's in your own community. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, for, well, say a restaurant, for me, buying from local farmers, uh, it, in the beginning it was more expensive. 
because there weren't the distribution routes in place. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, for, for me, it was uh, a great opportunity to have fresh local food. Uh, so, and the same thing could be said for energy. When we first uh, were deregulated, Pennsylvania and California were the first states to be deregulated, so we had the opportunity to buy renewable energy. And so even though it cost more money, I was excited about it. So uh, sometimes things cost more in the beginning, and in both cases they did. But the more people that buy local, and the more people that buy local energy or local food, the more the price goes down. Um, and that's what happened in both cases. Now renewable energy is about the same price as, as dirty energy, and uh, fresh local food is about the same price as uh, food that's shipped uh, long distances. And the compatibility with capitalism, I don't know if that's a goal to be compatible, but how, how do you see it connecting? Because again, Capitalism to most means exploitation. So business is beautiful when we make bus business decisions, not just um, on how much money this is going to make me, but how is this business decision going to affect uh, the people in my community, my employees, my customers, my neighbors, and how is this decision going to affect our natural world, mm -hmm. uh, as well as um, long-term uh, profitability. Uh, so I think that there's, uh, we need to have business, yeah. you know, and we all are talking now about building a new economy. Uh, and many of the people in this movement uh, don't even talk about business. They want a new economy, but they, they don't want business to be in it. Well, <laughs> we need businesses to have an economy. And I think there's many ways to do business uh, that is beautiful. And uh, one of the things that's developing more and more now is the idea of, co of cooperatives, you know, of having cooperative ownership, you know, whether it's a, uh, employee uh, worker ownership or um, producer ownership um, or uh, customer uh, ownership. But how do we recalibrate, or hand, how do we recalibrate expectations around financial return? You talk about a spectrum of return, a diverse economy of, of return. Can you elaborate on that a little bit and is it catching on? I think one thing is that we have to stop measuring success uh, by money. You know, that that's one of the biggest problems in our society, that that's how we measure our success. We need to measure our success by uh, the well-being of our communities and the well-being of our natural world, uh, because that's what supports life. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, um, uh, again, uh, whether we're a business owner making a decision or a consumer making a decision, how does my decision uh, create a better world uh, rather than, you know, can I get the cheapest food or the cheap or get the most money on my investment mm -hmm. uh, or as a business person get the highest price or all these kind of questions. If we, if we changed our perspective to really be focused on what, what really do we want mm -hmm. in the long run, uh, we want to, to be more happy, to have better health, and if we make our economic decisions uh, based on uh, on that would be a bit, lot better off. But a lot of people say, well, I I'm going to make my money, I'll invest, I'll do well, and then when I've covered my base, I've made my money, maybe I had to exploit a little bit in my business, but at the end of the day, then I'll be able to give to causes I believe in, then I'll be able to invest in the local Right, well that's, that's certainly that? the prevailing attitude, I, I've heard that many times. Uh, the problem there is that's, that it's actually the way we make our money that is most powerful. Um, and we need to change the way we make our money. And uh, nothing can undo the harm done uh, by a business that is uh, destroying the environment and causing inequality um, at the end of one's career than to uh, give your leftover change you know, to philanthropy to try and correct these, these problems. That's not going to happen. Uh, the power is in the day-to-day -day business decisions um, and getting those going in, in the right direction, which is toward a healthier and happier world. And government, is there a role for government in supporting the kind of local living economies that you're talking about? Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I welcome um, uh, collaboration, uh, especially with local government, uh, but federal government as well. I mean, you what know. What do you need? Well, from the farm bill, for instance, uh, is very destructive towards local farms. The largest subsidies go to large uh, corporate industrial farms that make uh, junk food uh, cheaper than healthy local food. It really should be the other way around. If we're going to have subsidies at all, why not subsidize uh, the, the local organic family farms so that uh, apples are cheaper than candy bars? You know, uh, and that's the way w w we should be looking at things. But also, traditionally, government, um, local and state government, have thought that their road to success in creating more jobs is to lure large corporations into their community that will give jobs 
uh, but uh, it's really just the opposite, that this is destructive towards the local economy, that we need to hold up our local entrepreneurs and have legislation and uh, economic development policies that support the development of local business ownership and producing basic needs in our own community, mm. from food to energy to clothing to building materials, that this is what brings um, uh, community wealth. This is what brings economic power to our communities and we need to be aligned with local politicians to make sure that uh, policies um, support this perspective. I've heard uh, development theory divided into the cultivators and the gatherers. The gatherers being those trying to bring people from someplace else and the cultivators trying to grow what's there. Mm. Talk about space making. Talk about activist space making because that's really what you accomplished at, at White Dog Cafe. You created a space where well, all sorts of things happen. Give us some examples and, and maybe advice to people who want to create a space like that, be it a cafe or a muffin shop as you began or something else. Right. Well, I do think that uh, food is a very good lure, <laughs> as I started <laughs> with, um, and having and, and fun in general, that if we want to uh, bring about change, we want to gather people to talk about change, uh, that we need to make it fun, uh, not to be self-righteous, uh, not to be gloom and doom, uh, but rather to really demonstrate the joy of community uh, mm -hmm. just through our gatherings. Uh, and that's what I tried to do at the White Dog, whether it was dancing in the street, uh, at Noche Latina or rum and reggae, uh, or having uh, table talks on public education or um, the drug wars or failed drug wars or, or whatever. This is a way of getting people to talk with each other. Um, I remember one time we were having a program on the lives of children in our city uh, and somebody in the audience said, why are, why are there no swings in the playground? Um, and whoever was speaking said, well, there, there's, there's no money to buy new swings. And so from that group, we started the swing project. Mm. And we raised money uh, to buy swings and install them in, in, in our uh, communities. So it's, um, I, I love that, that work, you know, of uh, picking subjects of, of, of public interest. You were informed a lot by your experiences um, in Central America. You've talked about the sister restaurant camp pain that you started in those years. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming the women's movement uh, affected you also? Yes, um, you know, I, I, uh, for sure, because when I was um, growing up, uh, I was prohibited from playing baseball, which was my passion, because I was a girl. Um, another favorite hobby of mine was building forts up in the woods, and I really wanted to take shops so I could learn how to use tools, but I was prohibited from doing that. I said I, uh, I was told that I had to take home ec because I was a girl and I had to learn to cook and sew. And I, I, I said, I will never cook. And I told my mom, I will never cook. And my mom said, someday you'll have children, you'll have to cook. And uh, so, you know, a lot of people think I got into the restaurant business because I cook. Well, that's not the truth. I got into the restaurant business so I wouldn't have to cook. Just get your hands on some tools. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I live above a restaurant, just go downstairs and eat. <laughs> What's next for you, Judy? Well, I'm not exactly sure. I, um, you know, I wrote the book uh, just a year and a half ago, and for the last year and a half I've been on a tour talking about my book in just different communities and really enjoying that, but really feeling like I want to come home again uh, and dig into my own community. Community. And, uh, you know, I was an entrepreneur for 40 years, so this is uh, new for me now, uh, not to have a business, and uh, not to be, you know, writing the book or talking about the book, so now what? And uh, I want a little time just to settle in. Uh, I know I want to work with the next generation mm -hmm. because I feel that transformative change comes about when uh, two generations in a row uh, share values in a, in, a, in a mission. And I feel that we have that opportunity now. When I was young, we were at odds with our parents, our baby boomer generation generation because of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. But now I find myself very much in alignment with my children's generation, the 30-somethings, the 20-somethings. Um, and I feel that our mutual interest in the environment and rising inequality is something that um, uh, bonds us. Uh, and that by working uh, with younger people, I can really have an impact uh, as an elder in my community to support the new green entrepreneurs coming along and those who are fighting uh, to stop climate change and so on. So I'm going to be of help in one way or the other, I know, but I'm not going to start another business, another organization. I want to help the next generation with their work. Well, we look forward to seeing what you come up with next. Thank Thanks, you. Laura. There's a lot of talk about the economy these days.
Some people say the economy's taking off. Some people say it's tanking. If you really want to make sense of the economy, it's useful to take a big step back and ask yourself, what does economy really mean? At the heart is this tiny little word, eco, and eco means home. Ecosystem is all of the complex relationships of home. It's all the living things, it's all the people. An ecosystem isn't just the catalog of all those things, it's really the relationships. Ecology is the knowledge or study of home. It is the prolonged and thoughtful observation of the living world around you and the consequences of your actions in it. And then you get economy. Economy is simply the management of home. So there are three basic pillars that are true for all economies. You need resources. You need land, air, water. You need the living world around you. The second pillar is you need work. You need labor to combine with those resources to produce stuff. And then you need a culture, a cosmology, a worldview that tells us what we can do with our labor towards what ends with the world around us. Then what are the pillars of the dominant economy, the economy that's all around us right now? Well, we get our resources through extraction. We forcefully remove them from the earth. We call this the extractive economy because it's extracting labor as well. We don't view labor as its own valuable natural resource to be applied towards the well-being of ourselves and our communities. And the culture, the worldview, is one in which we can have endless and infinite growth that either ignores or denies the real ecological and social consequences. And the rules that govern this economy with the use of speculation and financial instruments are towards one very particular end, the accumulation of greater and greater monetary wealth and power. The big corporations are being governed really for the benefit of their CEOs. It's not even for the shareholders anymore. It's certainly not for the workers, certainly not for the communities. In the same way that the basis of modern production is extraction from the planet, modern finance is extraction from the larger community towards the financial community towards 1%. The system rewards certain people's effort far more than others. This is not only an economic issue about who's getting the money, it's also a racial issue, it's also a class issue. Capitalism has exploited people and often leaves out people of color, immigrants, minority communities, women. At some point, people are like, no, you cannot do that to me and to my community in my home and therefore the only way to keep it going is to use force. It's a banks and tanks economy. So the question is, if the extractive economy is what got us into the mess we're in right now, can it get us out? Not likely. What is required is fundamentally to transform, to transform the way things are structured. The depth to which corporations are integrated into economies around the world mean that we absolutely have to think at the global level, at the international level. We want to make sure that our productive systems are sustainable. We can't hope that a concentrated power on top just starts acting better. The way that we've been shown that can actually make sustainability in the long term is by breaking that power and by sharing that power democratically. We need to explore new ways of managing home based on that thoughtful and prolonged observation of the living world around us, ecology. The new economy has to step away and then push back at those old pillars because it has to be a new economy that is about sustainable resources, that puts people before profit, that puts planet before profit. The first pillar is to rethink our relationship to resources. There's simply no way that we can have this endless, limitless, infinite growth on what is, I think, obviously a finite planet. The second pillar has to replace the exploitation of human labor with a recognition that all wealth comes through work. And when we take our labor and apply it towards economic well-being, we can create a new cycle that's not based on extraction, but that's based on regeneration. That requires a new third pillar, a new way of imagining our relationship to each other and to home 
It's not only possible, it's happening all around us. One of the most inspiring things is that there are people and groups all over the country and the world who are organizing both to meet people's needs and to actually confront the systems that are underneath the crises. Underlying all of it is the small-d democracy. I think it could actually change the way things are going to have people actually participating in the decisions that are governing their lives. Any economic transition has to have this notion of restructuring the way we think about ownership. Resources are owned by people, by communities. They are not owned by a corporation. The privatization of resources will have to end. That demands some political muscle, some organizing muscle, and some idea muscle. How do we develop new business models that create more local ownership and more democratic ownership? Not just bringing food into communities, but who owns the stores? Who's processing the food? Who's selling the food to the hospitals and the schools in the communities? We believe that the more people that have access to opportunities to be able to thrive, the better our society will be as a whole. The most basic thing we're talking about is human consciousness, and not in the sense of self-awareness, in the sense of how we behave, how we think, how we understand the world we're in, and how we form relationships. And the extent that we start transforming those understandings and those relationships, that's part of forming the new economy today, here and now. By looking at how we live, we can find how we can live better, more interconnected lives, and simultaneously invest in and build the economy we know we need, and maybe even be happier for it. Communism, capitalism. I just spent a week in Hungary in Europe where anyone in their 50s has spent more or less equal parts of their life under each of those systems. And what many of those people find surprising right now is just how little has changed. As one resident of Budapest exclaimed to me last week, 25 years after the transition, the one thing we didn't expect was for so much to be the same. It's a cautionary tale, I think, for those in the States who talk about creating a new economy. In the late 1980s, my Budapest friends believed they were about to make a new economy too. And to some extent, they did. They can travel more freely now and start their own businesses. With Western encouragement, Hungary's state-owned companies were privatized, its cooperative farms split up. But instead of redistributing assets into more hands, Hungary's mostly passed from one 1% to another. Today, Starbucks, McDonald's, and Tesco's are a common sight on Budapest's boulevards, but so are homeless people, beggars, and the unemployed. Eurostat, a data firm, reports that more than a quarter of Hungarians were living in extreme poverty last year, and the old practice continues of playing politics with people's needs. Today's elites dispense benefits and public jobs, just as the old regime passed out perks and favors to its friends. To explain the pain in the system, right-wing demagogues blame familiar targets, among them gypsies, queers, and Jews. In his State of the Union address this year, Prime Minister Viktor Orban attacked immigrants, foreigners, and multiculturalism and called for higher birth rates for Hungarians. Did Hungarians hope for more for sure, and gradually they're figuring out how to get it. As I left, hundreds were in the streets protesting corruption. Ownership in their new economy shifted from public to private hands. But the question they have to grapple with now is the big one. Just what is the economy for? For community or for control? It's the same question we face here. To tell me what you think, write to me, laura at grittv.org. And thanks. The war on drugs has shattered too many lives to count. Johan Hari believes we misunderstand the problem. We've created a culture where really large numbers of the people around us can't bear to be present in their lives. They need to medicate themselves to get through the day. Now that's an indictment of the whole consumerist, 
world that we have built. Then a glimpse of what fighting that war actually looks like up close. We're the next generation after the civil rights movement. In the first weekend in May, Jackson, Mississippi played host to a landmark conference. Called Jackson Rising, the three-day event attracted activists and entrepreneurs from around the region and the world interested in building economic power in low-income communities. The conference was conceived as part of late Mayor Shokwe Lumumba's plan to develop Mississippi's aging capital from the bottom up through what he called solidarity economics. But Jackson isn't the only city experiencing a grave wealth gap these days. How might worker-owned co-ops help build strong local economies that are good for everyone? Thanks to support from our viewers, Grid TV was able to attend Jackson Rising with TESSA, the toolbox for education and social action.